On Halloween of 2008, this took place. When I was 14 years old, I recall being eagerly looking forward to Halloween. We were able to remain out later than normal because it fell on a Friday. After trick-or-treating, my friend Matthew and I were going to return to my place for a sleepover. My dad, a security guard who worked overnight shifts, and I shared a home. He was going to be gone essentially from dusk till dawn, leaving Matthew and I on our own. Around 7 o'clock, Matthew arrived, and we hastily donned our inexpensive costume and left to go trick-or-treating in our neighborhood. Our location in this wooded area with the incredibly dispersed houses was always the worst. The distance between each residence was usually a good quarter mile. The homeowners frequently distributed more candy to make up for the distance, so it appears that they were aware of it. Of course, as we made our way from door to house, we ran into other trick-or-treaters, but there weren't as many as one might anticipate given the small number of children residing in the region. After trick-or-treating for about two hours, I saw someone following us. It was either a grown man or a very tall child, and I couldn't tell if he was wearing a Michael Myers mask. At first, I assumed he was trick-or-treating like everyone, else, but there was nothing in his bag to hold candy, and it was just him. We continued visiting houses, but the unknown man kept following. I noticed pretty quickly that he wasn't even approaching the front doors of the houses to get candy. Instead, he stayed behind us once more, so I told Matthew. Despite the fact that it wasn't like he was with his child or anything, Matthew was still determined to keep going. He reassured me that if the man followed us, we could turn around. There was a shortcut through the woods that led directly to my house, so we took it sprinting. We had no idea if we were being followed, but anyway, we started locking all the doors and windows as soon as we entered the woods. This time, I could tell he was a little more on it. When I heard Matthew screaming from back downstairs, while I was upstairs shutting my bedroom when I hurried, he was standing at the window in the living room. When I questioned him about what was wrong, he didn't respond and instead pointed out the window. I glanced back at Matthew after he had told me that a man wearing a Michael Myers mask was standing there, squinting as my eyes adapted to the darkness, and I saw were trees. Now, I initially assumed he was attempting to intimidate, but when I turned around, I genuinely saw him standing in the middle of a forest, halfway hidden by a tree. I remained still and walked to the kitchen to get the phone. I stepped back to the window and dialed my father. When he answered the phone, I told him that there was a stranger outside wearing a Michael Myers mask as I peered out the window. I advised him that he was probably just some teenager trying to scare you, so make sure all the doors are locked and ignore him. This was not the response I had hoped for, but I began to wonder if perhaps he was correct. I tried to put it out of my mind when Matthew and I went to my room upstairs, but it was pretty much all we could think of. When the sound of breaking glass came from downstairs, we were trying to come up with plausible answers. My heart began to race, and neither of us knew what to do. The phone was back downstairs, so we turned out the light and went into the closet. We shuffled to the way back, honey, behind hanging clothes out of you. For the next five minutes, there was complete silence. Then, footsteps entered the room and began to move around. At that point, the wardrobe door slowly opened. A full minute must have passed of nothing but silence before Matthew's screams broke the stillness. He pulled me out of the closet while still wearing the Michael Myers mask and brandishing him. During the battle that brought Matthew to the ground, the assailant dropped his knife, and in a matter of seconds, Matthew was pinned down. I snatched the knife and plunged it into the man's leg, causing him to fall on his side and scream in agony. Matthew got up, and we rushed downstairs to my neighbor's house, where we knocked on the door until they opened. To cut a long tail short, we explained our position and they let us inside while they phoned the police. When the police arrived, they were unable to locate the man who was missing from the resident and were left with only a shattered window and a missing kitchen knife as evidence of the encounter. I was unharmed, but Matthew wasn't that fortunate. That he struggled with the man, he suffered a cut down his arm. To this day, I always wonder about that night. They searched for a blood trail, but never discovered one. When I was 19, I still lived at home with my parents. On Halloween, they made me throw out candy to the neighborhood children, but I didn't mind because our living room was right next to the front door. I just put on a movie and got up whenever the doorbell. We had just finished watching The Dark Knight when our home phone rang. It said, unknown caller, and that was all it said. 
Since we had just gotten a new set of phones and a new number, we hadn't yet given it to anyone. I didn't think it was someone I knew, but I still decided to answer. It was around 10 p.m., and the doorbell rings were slowing down by this point. Both of my parents had gone to me. Soon after the phone rang again, and said the same thing. I assumed they had the wrong number. A mystery caller. I took it up once more. Once more, a male voice responded, Who are you? I was beginning to realize that it was probably just someone trying to play a joke on, but that's what you'd expect from a kid, or at the very least a teenager, and it sounded like whoever was on the other end of that coup was much older than a teenager. It was Halloween night, so I can't even blame them. Over the course of the next 10 minutes, six or seven more phone calls came and finally I picked up again this time. I didn't say anything, there were a few seconds of silence. Before the man started talking, I'll be honest, I don't remember exactly what was said, but it was something like how the guy was outside our house, and then I needed to unlock the back door, so he could get in, he said if we called the cops, he was going to kill everyone inside before they could arrive to the line. I went to the kitchen while crawling on all fours to block any wind, and grabbed the biggest knife I could. I then crept to my parents' room, and shook my dad awake, by whispering that someone was outside near the back door. He immediately got out of bed and grabbed his loaded revolver as we crept through the house. I should probably now explain the situation. When we arrived at the back door, I told him about all the phone calls. He immediately unlocked it and stepped outside without hesitation before firing one bone into the air. As soon as he did, three men appeared from a row of bushes next to the house and started running into the forest behind our house. My dad tried to chase them, for, but they were much faster than him and vanished into the trees. We called the police and reported their activity, but there was nothing they could do. We have no idea who they were, and we have no idea why they had our phone numbers. On Halloween last year, this happened. Michael, my best friend, was 17 at the time, and I was 18 years old. Despite the fact that we both knew we were too old to trick or treat, we also agreed that it wouldn't be any fun if there was no candy. Michael had an idea at that point. We always claimed we'd look into this old, abandoned house that was close to mine. We eventually decided that Halloween would be the ideal night. We waited until it was dark, and then we waited some more until there were fewer trick-or-treaters outside, at which point we grabbed a couple flashlights and went outside. It took us a while, but we eventually arrived at the house, which was obviously in a terrible state because it had been abandoned. Trash was all over the floor, windows were boarded up, and so on. We entered the front door, half expecting it to be locked, but it was open. It was pitch black inside, so we made the best of the situation by looking around. The house had two floors, and we explored the bottom floor in search of anything intriguing before moving upstairs, where we discovered two rooms right away. While Michael entered the room on the right, I proceeded into the room to the left. I started to search about, checking the wardrobe and the drawers, but I couldn't find anything interesting. I clearly remember being by the window as Michael's gut-wrenching screams could be heard coming from the other room. I rushed straight to the room where he had first disappeared, but until I flashed my torch into the rear left corner, I saw nothing out of the ordinary. There, I observed Michael being choked by a person dressed entirely in black and sporting a Halloween mask. Since there was no more light, and I could see that his face was turning red, I did the only thing I could think of. I threw my torch as hard as I could at the intruder. After hitting him in the side, he let go of Michael and yelled in pain while still holding his side. After running downstairs, we were able to stumble out of the house in the pitch black. We turned back around and started running as soon as we exited the building, but not before noticing three figures in the upstairs when all of them were wearing the same Halloween mask dot as we neared my driveway. We eventually came to a stop, and I knelt down, breathing heavily. Neither of us knew what to do or think about what we had just discovered. Later that evening, Michael told me what had happened to him when he entered that room and began investigating it like he would any other room. The part that disturbs me the most is how Michael described being held. He said that whoever was in the mask had to have been using all their force on his neck. After a while, he noticed something in the corner and shined his torch at it to see that it was a Halloween mask. He walked over to it thinking it was prompted up against the wall. However, when it moved slightly, he realized it was a person. 
This is when I entered the room. He wasn't just being restrained. He was held there for almost 20 seconds without being able to. We have no idea what we found as I've already stated, and we have no idea what those individuals were up to. However, we concur that it wasn't anything we were expected to witness. We really came close to dying that night, I think. Thank you for joining us in the darkness tonight. As the shadows close in, remember that the line between reality and the macabre is thinner than you think. Stay tuned for more bone-chilling tales await in the depths of our channel. Don't forget to subscribe, and may your nightmares be ever so thrilling.